Dear audience, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Erőd János Zsigmond, and my PhD topic is about the management of cardiac implantable electronic devices. Uh, my vision is that if we cooperate and if we gather our knowledge, then we can master the available data more effectively. And my aim to achieve this is to work with you and learn from you. Here you can see our two ongoing projects, and let's start with the first one. In this one, we are investigating the effect of different optimization techniques in patients with cardiac resynchronization therapy in a systematic review and network meta-analysis. So we know that uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, or shortly CRT, is a life-saving therapy for patients with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction and also long QRS duration. However, we also know that a really high, a really high percentage of these patients up to 40% uh, are not improving after the therapy and they are called no responders. And the problem with this population is that they have an increased risk of mortality and hospitalization. We have some studies which su suggested that uh, atrioventricular and also interventricular delay, even after CRT, are really common in this population. And we also have signals from clinical trials that if we try to optimize these delays, if we try to tailor the therapy based on the individual patient's needs, then we can improve uh, CRT response rate and this way long-term outcomes. But the problem comes when we ask the question, how should we optimize these devices? Because fortunately or unfortunately, we have many techniques and many options to do so. So in our uh, study, we wanted to address this question and to find the best optimization technique to improve CRT response rate and also long-term outcomes. Uh, we compared the newest optimization technique, dynamic device-based algorithms, to three other techniques, mainly echocardiography, static device-based algorithms, and empirical settings, the last meaning that we don't optimize the patient, but we use an universal or empirical value, which we think that it will be good for the patient. Uh, we performed our systematic search in three big databases, and in the end we found 43 eligible articles, which also included the outcomes which we wanted to analyze. First, we analyzed echocardiographic outcomes, namely echocardiographic response, which is a dihotomous outcome, and also continuous outcomes like improvement in ejection fraction and decrease in the end systolic volume and end diastolic volumes. Uh, an important thing to mention here is that on the forest plots now, in the rows you can't see individual studies, but we instead we presented each treatment in each row compared to dynamic optimization. And this way the rows represent the final diamond of a usual forest plot. And you may notice also that we have dashed lines, which means that that particular comparison was not uh, investigated in a real life clinical trial. It's only an indirect network estimate. So talking about echocardiographic response, you can see a green highlight, which means that we uh, found a statistically significant difference between dynamic optimization and echocardiography, the dynamic arm achieving a two times higher odds ratio compared to echocardiography. And we also observed a really similar tendency in case of empirical settings, but this was not statistically significant and it was only driven from indirect uh, evidence. As you can see, in case of uh, the continuous outcomes, we don't have green highlights. None of the comparisons reach statistical significance, but what we can also see is that dynamic uh, algorithms in each and every comparison reached the best results or tended to reach the best results. And this tendency is also really nicely visible on these Sukra plots, where each treatment is ranked by the probability to achieve better results. And uh, the red line, the um, line which is uh, representing dynamic optimization, is clearly separating from the other three lines, achieving or tending to achieve the best outcomes. We also analyzed uh, clinical um, outcomes, clinical improvement, uh, and in these cases, the follow-up duration was available for 3 to 12 months. In case of all-cause mortality, we didn't observe relevant differences. However, in case of heart failure hospitalization, the dynamic group achieved 
significantly lower event rate compared to echocardiography. And in this particular comparison, also a clinical a response, clinical improvement uh, favored the dynamic arm, uh, which means an improvement in the New York Heart Association classification. We also investigated six minute walk test, which is another marker of clinical performance of clinical well-being. And also in this case, dynamic optimization uh, tended to achieve better outcomes, significantly better outcomes compared to echocardiography. So up to now, I talked about uh, scenarios, about studies, which investigated um, patients who were implanted with a CRT device, but um, uh, uh, directly after the implantation, they were optimized and then followed up. But it is not that uncommon that uh, a patient who was not uh, optimized after the implantation comes back at a follow-up visit and we find out that uh, he or she is no responder based on some clinical or echocardiographical criteria. The question comes, what should we do in case of those, case, uh, those patients? And uh, in the guidelines, we can find a really weak recommendation that we may uh, use optimization in these cases. However, uh, there is no strong recommendation. So we also wanted to address this question and investigate the role of optimization in no responders. And on this graph, you can see the percentage of no responders who actually improved after um, implementing an optimized CRT. The problem uh, with this analysis was that um, these studies, these seven study, um, used really different response criteria, different optimization methods, and also the follow-up times were different, as you can see on the table below. Uh, so we couldn't um, uh, uh, couldn't use, uh, couldn't make a qualitative uh, analysis, a quantitative analysis, sorry. But uh, what we can say at least qualitatively is that if we use optimization, then from 30% to almost 70% of the patients will, response, will really respond. So what can we say in conclusion? We suggest for our clinicians to use dynamic algorithms instead of echocardiography uh, at the time of the CRT implantation to improve uh, cardiac reverse remodeling echo response and also to achieve better clinical improvement and lower hospitalization rate. But we can still uh, not answer the crucial question, is optimization, dynamic algorithms are better than empirical settings. So in this setting, we need more trials. Here you can see our graphical abstract and also our manuscript status. We submitted it uh, to the EP Europase journal and we are waiting editorial board response. And uh, speaking about our second project, in this one, we want to investigate the role of different biomarkers, different hematological parameters in predicting cardiac implantable electronic device infection in the context of a registry analysis. Well, the most dangerous and maybe the most feared complication of device implantation is uh, the infection on the endovascular system or, or the pocket. Uh, this uh, complication, fortunately, has a relatively low incidence, but the problem lies when we uh, in the mortality rates, when, because when we look at the mortality rates, we can see that they are really high. And another problem in device infection is that if you want to treat it effectively, we have to extract in the total endovascular system and combine this with prolonged antibiotic therapy, which is which can be really harmful for the patient and also costly for the healthcare systems. So we have to prevent device infection whenever we can. And in the guidelines, uh, the guidelines are saying that we should not implant or we should try to delay implantation if we see a patient who has clinical signs of infection. However, we don't really know uh, much or we don't know anything about patients who are presenting with subclinical infection but may be at high risk for infection. And in those cases, hematological parameters and biomarkers could be of use to identify high-risk patients. But the problem is that, as stated by this recent meta-analysis, uh, the knowledge in this field is really gappy. So as I said, in our study, we want to find out if indeed these brain implant biomarkers can predict early and uh, delayed device infection in patients who are undergoing device implantation. The next steps for our projects uh, are um, the editorial response in case of the first project, 
And uh, in case of the second project, we are actively enrolling the patients. Up to now, we enrolled uh, around uh, 200 patients, but due to the low incidence of device infection, we will need far more, much more to uh, perform uh, um, successfully powered analysis. For example, in these uh, 200 patients, we have only two patients uh, with infection. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, please don't forget that we have to do things because according to an expert opinion by Master Yoda, trying is not an option. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adud. Uh, regarding your second project, what is your current practice in your institute? Uh, thank you for the question. So the current practice uh, at our institute and I think at most institu institutes uh, in Hungary is to uh, record biomarkers, namely CRT and blood count, uh, CRP and uh, blood count. And uh, if we saw that these uh, markers are elevated, or at least before the COVID era, if we saw that these markers were elevated, we tried to delay the, inf uh, the implantation and wait until the CRP values uh, um, are uh, declining. Uh, this, it, this was the old practice. Now, if we don't see clinical signs and we see um, um, moderately, let's say moderately um, elevated CRP, uh, we are implanting the patients, so we are not delaying. And how do you deal with the uh, diabetic patients, for example, with poor control diabetes or immunocompromised patients, for example, on steroid therapy? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, regarding patients on a steroid therapy, uh, they are at high risk, like patients with diabetes, with uncontrolled diabetes. And uh, thanks to Nikki, uh, we also included in our registry the um, uh, control of the the markers, which are um, telling us if the uh, diabetic, if the disease of the patient, the di diabetic patient, is controlled or uncontrolled. Uh, we are not um, uh, recording uh, samples uh, regarding this now in everyday clinical practice. Uh, we are measuring glucose levels, but not um, uh, glu uh, glucat hemoglobin. So, uh, and regarding steroid uh, patients on steroid. Uh, I think that there we should be more cautious and if we see an elevated CRP with a patient uh, on steroid, then we should think more. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, do you use uh, antibiotic um, um, pockets uh, for uh, immunocompromised patients? Uh, thank you for your question. Where, um, Antibiotic packets are used uh, mainly if we implant, uh, ma mainly uh, after repeated extractions. So if the patient had a previous infection or uh, if he or she is uh, deemed to be at high risk uh, of infection. So basically patients who are immunocompromised, the definition is really wide, but uh, if we consider the patient uh, being immunocompromised, we should use these antibiotic packets, but uh, it's not, um, how to put it, it's not uh, really common to use antibiotic packet if we implant a patient uh, who uh, the, at the primary implant. And um, uh, even if we, at the primary implant, if we think that the patient is uh, really at a really high risk of infection, we still have an option to implant a leadless pacemaker uh, be, uh, for example, in case of uh, patients with uh, chronic uh, kidney disease or on dialysis, uh, we, um, we are implanting uh, these devices. Thank you. Please uh, tell us your opinion. What is the typical source of that kind of infections? Uh, so device, uh, you mean device infections? Uh, the typical source is uh, the skin, for, uh, skin, skin flora. So the typical organisms are Streptococci and, Staph uh, and Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, this can be prevented if we use um, adequate um, anti, uh, ad um, if we work within uh, an adequately sterile um, area. So uh, this is the typical source and uh, this is the exogenous source. If we have a patient with infection or subclinical infection, 
there comes the exo uh, the endogenous source. So we have an uh, endogenous um, uh, source of the infection where the bacteria is uh, colonized, or we have a bloodstream infection, let's say sepsis. Then uh, the infection can come uh, from endogenous sources as well. And uh, there are some cases where we have both.